orcs got the mob treatment. Sure. Under um, the goblinoids, kobolds are... Yeah, yeah, I mean, and we got drow, so elves are kind of in there. But of the playable races, which do you think has the best kind of base foundation to build a wonderful, flavorful mob out of? I got a 19. I got to throw it outside and hit your can of beer. I got an 11. I don't know, man. I want I could I could do it reverse easily. Like I think that that uh, the Bullywug should have a playable race like option sure. for it. Okay, I, I can do that a few times with the ones that we've covered. I don't know why Sahuagin is not an option if orcs and 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 whatnot are. But like, I mean, they're lawful evil. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. Be? Um, which playable race? Uh, you know what? You know what? Give it to halflings. Oh, really? Okay. Give halfling culture and identity. Yes, I'm with you on that one. For me. Dwarves. Dwarves are militaristic. They're ordered. They're they've got that flavor already built in. I want to see legions of unique dwarves statted up, or I could say also dragonborn because it'd give them a chance to fix their fuck up and give them dark vision. It's a mimic, the roundtable Dungeons and Dragons discussion podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to the final episode in our conversation on mob mentalities. We spent the last half a year in... Sorry. <laughs> that that was my celebratory opening, because we're done! COVID isolation. Reaching out to our friends from around North America so that we could break down <laughs> the humanoids in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. I'm breaking down as a humanoid. That right make now. up the various hordes, mobs, tribes, hosts, armies, cults, packs, and warbands. I'm Adam... And this drunk across from me is Dan. Hello. And this episode is called Previously on Hoarders. <laughs> that one didn't rhyme and I liked it. Oh, shit, it man. It might be the alcohol talker. In this episode, we're going to take a brief look at the remaining mob monsters that exist out there and go over what we've already learned and what we liked and disliked about the low-level enemy forces in D&D 5th Edition. If you include the first few episodes on monsters that we did within our first 50 episodes... We've already covered orcs in three episodes, not including our episode on half orcs as playable characters. We've also looked at goblinoids for four episodes, gnolls for three, zombies and skeletons for a total of four un undead, and kobolds and yuan-ti for two each. We had an episode dedicated to bullywugs way back in the early days of the podcast, as well as one semi-recently on lizard folk. And of course, there were the two on the many kinds of lycanthropes. Our two Sahuagin episodes also covered sea elves and tritons, and our third underwater episode took a look at Kuotoa, Merfolk, <laughs> and Murrow. God, I was hoping we had retired that. <laughs> nope. And none of that includes the multitude of beasts and mounts that we've discussed that are tied into these mobs, including poisonous and constrictor snakes, aurochs, wargs, giant lizards, and giant bats, ravens, sharks, hyenas, wolves, boars, rats, bats, jackals, tigers, and bears, oh my, and of course, the giant frog. We don't know what app you're listening on, but if you'd like to go back and check out one of these topics, we have an episode guide on our subreddit, r slash it's a mimic, and our YouTube channel has our library broken into helpful playlists. We've covered a lot in the past half a year. Everything from Yunagu's personal pet to cultists and necromancers. From unique zombies that will confuse longtime players to the embodiment of a goblinoid trickster god. From the demons who make deals with orcs and lizard folk to a literal avalanche of bones with a mind of its own. Armies and hermits, land and sea, gods and demons, blasphemous rituals and horrible curses, all of these things have taken us from neutral good to chaotic evil in our look at mobs. So, what's left to talk about? Nothing, we're done. That's the end of the podcast. <laughs> you wish. <laughs> these mobs, this has been a grind for us to go through all these stat blocks. It, it's been an undertaking to be to be completely forthright and meta uh, about it. Like, it's been an undertaking. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we did it, but I'm glad we're done. I have to say, we could not have done this without everybody else helping out. And so I'm eager to get them back in the guild house here so that we can start getting back into a regularly scheduled program. Yeah. Um, but we've got a couple of things planned for the next few weeks where it's just you and I here, Dan, talking. Um, some interesting and fun conversations. I'm excited about them. Sure, so. yeah. But let's let's wrap up these mobs that we've looked at, okay? I'm going to go through each one of them, and I kind of want to get some some notes, some thoughts from you on this, okay? Sure. So let's roll initiative now, and we're just going to apply this initiative to all of them. Sure, as we yeah, go. sounds good. 
Natural 20. And a natural one. Well, Dan, you have earned the right to go first on these. Let's talk about orcs first. Okay. okay? Orcs are, by the broad strokes, I mean, if, if you want the nitty gritties of these, go into the episodes. But by, by the broad strokes, they're a nomadic tribal group. Yeah. They have an orc, a war chief, an eye of Groomsh, an orog. The Hand of Yertris and the Nurture One of Yertris, which is those uh, sickly ones. Yeah, they're the diseased and plagued ones. Yep. The Red Fang of Shargas, which was the uh, the stealthy assassin. Yep. The Blade of Ilnival and the Claw of Luthic. The Claw of Luthic was a den, den mother, mother kind yeah, of. Yeah. Um, the Orok, which is the battle bull. The giant bat, which the Red Fang of Shargas rode. And then, of course, the Tanarik, which was half demonic. Yeah. When you think about this structure... What, like, what have you learned? What is the thing that you, your big takeaway, when do you use this in a campaign? I go by Oscar the Orc on the interwebs. Sure. My love of orcs uh, crosses genre um, through everything from... It was right into the romance novels that you read. Uh, yep, Tusk Love is a great book. Anyways, uh, my... You, you of, did that way too quickly, so that has to be a real thing. It's on Critical Role. Okay. Yeah. Christ. I was really <laughs> concerned for a second. Um, I collect an orc army for Warhammer 40k. I play an orc in World of Warcraft. I My main character, my iconic, is a half-orc barbarian. I love orcs. So when I think of orcs, I've always thought of this roaming wave of savage nomads. Right? Yeah. So as a DM, when I'm using orcs, which exist in every single one of my campaigns and will be major players. If you are in one of my campaigns, you will fight orcs full stop. It will happen. Why? Because I love them and I love using them. And if I'm DMing, I don't get to play a character, so I'm doing it. So when should other people use them? Whenever you have that army that is a traveling, nomadic, large swat, like you want that barbarian feel, you go to orcs. You want that... On the fringes of society could possibly, if you could talk to them when they're not foaming at the mouth, uh, could possibly be reasoned with to have some sort of deal with them so that they don't attack you and your farmers. That's when I'm using orcs. They are as much an environmental hazard as they are a physical threat to a kingdom. They are changing the landscape as they go. Yeah, exactly. So... Of the ones that we listed off, which one stands out to you as being kind of the MVP, the unique one that you're excited to use in a future campaign? Um, I Man, I, I love the Hand of Yertris. I love the plague, the underhanded... It breaks the mold for orcs with me, right? These weird nurses that are like um, helping orcs get more disease so they can blow up on the battlefield. Exactly, right? The, the using orcs as siege weapons. Yeah, I'm on board. I gotta say... I am the most excited by far about the Tanaruk. Oh yeah, no, yeah, that that's a close second for sure. I, I really need there to be that demonic thing at the beginning when this when the orc horde who tends to leave settlements, they'll kill the warriors, but they'll leave the women and children yeah. to rebuild the settlement so they can swoop back in ten years and raid it again. Yeah, not with the Tanaruk when it starts burning everything to the ground because it's it's got this demonic influence. You're going to have to figure out why it's doing something different. And there is a very evil central piece to that puzzle. That when your players figure it out, they're in for a rough go. This gives them the ability to be a campaign threat. So moving on then, Goblinoids. Now the Goblinoids host is its own big separate crazy thing. We had to do three episodes. Yeah. Because there's so many of them. We did the Bugbear and the Bugbear Chief. And those are the only Bugbears that we get criminally right. undersupported. Yep, there's the Goblin, Goblin Boss, Booyog Caster, Booyog Wielder, Booyog Whip, and the Booyog, 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 not to mention the three different kinds of Booyog Slaves, which are different kinds of Warlocks. Yes. We also got the Nilbog, which was the evil trickster god yeah, embodiment. Yeah, Goblin backwards. Yep. Um, Bargest, which is essentially a werewolf, of, but a Yugoloth-inspired werewolf that haunts and kills Goblins. Goblins and, and hides in their midst. And then we have Hobgoblins, uh, their captain, a warlord, the Devastator, which was the big magic powerhouse. Yep. And then the Iron Shadow, which was the monk flavor. And we got wargs and ravens as well as being very tied into their lore. Yeah. So Goblinoids are a host. They function separately as three different kinds of societies. Bugbears are very simplistic. Yeah. But the others are a little bit more um, well-developed, but they will come together. They will come together for a huge religious-based 
army to to carve out and change the landscape. It is an instinct amongst all goblinoids to join the host. Even goblins who get the raw end of this deal there, like they get the short end of the stick. Um, when it comes to the hosts, they are instinctually inclined to join a host whenever it happens. Yeah, absolutely. So when do you use this in a campaign? Um, when should other people use this in a campaign? I know when you use it, you use goblins all the time. Goblins I, are a regular feature for you. I use goblins all the time. I love goblins. Um, when I have to choose for my low level mob, I either go goblins or cobalt. Like you get that goblins or cobalt. I almost uh, yeah. never go cobalt. I go goblins. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Um, that being said, uh, if I want an escalating nuisance to give to the party, I'm going to go goblinoids. Low level. I'm going to go with like the little goblin tribes, right? And your party clears them out, but a couple get away. And then you level up a couple times, go through main main plot, but then the goblins have come back and this time they've picked up a bugbear or two. Or they're a little bit beefier. And like, they're that ever escalating campaign-wide threat till tier four, where now you're dealing with a fully formed host that has several devastators and iron shadows and and a, a warlord leaning it. And, you know... um, Maglubiet is going to be raised up by this host, right? Like that's that's when I want to use it, a goblinoid host. So when should other people use it? Okay, so which one is the standout? What is the MVP from the goblinoid host for you? I I, I want to say Buyag Buyag Buyag, but it's not that. The Buyag 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 is just a, a load of fun. A load of fun, but it's an NPC stat block that's made a goblin. Yeah, it's a goblin sorcerer. Right? Um, the Barghest. The yeah. bar guest by far is the standout for me. And the reason is the lore, not necessarily the stats. The fact that the bar guest is this Yugoloth inspired twisted goblin wolf thing. Man, this thing's horrifying. It is absolutely horrifying. And you can have entire campaigns based around the bar guest terrorizing a up until now peaceful goblin village or goblin tribe. Right. Um, the bar guest is so flavorful and useful. I love it. For me, it's got to be the the hobgoblin warlord. I'm going to parade him in front of the party at low levels. Yeah, I want them to meet this guy. He needs to be brilliant. He is charismatic as all hell because he is bringing everyone together through force of will, and he is leading. This is a big bad in the making. Yes, and I love it. And he's so low level, right, compared to what you would expect your demi liches and your dragons and whatnot. As a big bad for, let's say, a level 12, up to level 12 campaign, what you would expect out of a regular module. Mm -hmm. You you get so much out of this guy who's going to strategize. He will sit down and talk to you. He will parlay with you. Yeah. you if you wave the white flag, he will say, all right, let them in. We're going to talk. But he's never alone. No, never. And you are at his mercy while you are behind enemy lines. But he's also going to honor it. They are honorable creatures. Bugbears and goblins aren't, and most of the mobs aren't. Yeah. So this gives you a unique opportunity to have an opposing army and a general who is willing, or who is able to be a character. Yeah, yeah. And not just a cackling evil maniac. All right, let's, uh, what do we cover next? Kobolds. Kobolds are the little dragon people with dreams of, of delusions of grandeur, really, right? Uh, they live in warrens. They're all about traps. They're all about survival and propagating. They don't really want much to do with humanoids because they tend to be victims. Yep. Um, but they've got a few interesting, unique ways about them. We've been given the Cobalt and the Dragon Shield Cobalt, which is, of course is just beefier. The Cobalt Inventor, which is the one that's using insects and green slime and skunks yeah. as weapons. Um, there's the Underling, which is essentially... The kobold that then runs forward and explodes. Yep. Uh, there's the scale sorcerer, which is right there in the name. And the Icewind Dale kobold, which is a hardier, beefier kind of kobold. For it, the it's, cold it's a kobold that can withstand the rigors of the tundra. Kind of. Close. It still needs the trappings yep. of, of civilization. And of course, you get the outcasts, which was a winged kobold. When do you use kobolds in a campaign? When should others? I like using kobolds in a campaign when I need foot soldiers for a dragon. When I need that persistent pest that is serving some big bad evil guy that just happens to be scaled. <laughs> right? Or at least have some sort of... A dragonborn wizard that has become a lich could run a uh, 
full army of kobolds in a mountain. So I, I like kobolds for that. Um, I, if, if there are, if there's a dwarf in my party and there is a problem in his, uh, home mountain, the, the, the mines that he grew up in, it's probably going to be kobolds that his tribe's dealing with. So that is when I'm going to use kobolds. I like kobolds for a little bit simpler storytelling, especially at low levels. They're the thieves that are going to come in and steal your shit in the middle of the night. Yep. And then you're going to be surprised at how challenging it is to hunt your shit down to get in there because it's all small-sized warrens and tunnels. You are at a disadvantage all of the time yep. on their home turf. And it's going to throw your players outside of their comfort level. So that's why I like to use them. What's your favorite one? In the Inventor. Yeah. Without, without hesitation, the Inventor. I wish there were more just kooky do crazy level, low level mobs like the Inventor. I gotta say, my favorite's the winged kobold. I like, it surprised me that they were outcasts. Considering they have wings like a dragon. And then they were kicked out because the, the, the kobolds think they're essentially aberrant. Cursed, yeah. Like negative, cursed creatures. It's really interesting. I like that dynamic. I really enjoy the winged kobold. And it makes for a really interesting ally against the rest of the kobolds. Yeah. So the next one we covered was gnolls. <laughs> so... Gnolls are a force of freaking nature. One of the big complaints that we see online is that they're not a regular playable race. Yep. Um, uh, I prefer them this way. Uh, based on the Lauren 5e, if they were a playable race, it wouldn't make sense. No, they are ferocious. They are vicious. They are consistently gnashing teeth. They are putting down their injured friends and let, instead of healing them. Mm-hmm. This is about spreading chaos and destruction at the behest of their demon lord, uh, who is forcing them and their ilk into the world. And because the only way they're created, right? Oh yeah, this is very much, these guys are designed minions of pure evil. Yeah. Right? And so we got a bunch of interesting, very strange additions to their horde, or their war bands, I guess, as they're called. We got the Knoll, the basic one, and a hyena. The pack lord, which is, you know, their basic boss level, right? Then you got the Knoll Hunter, which focuses on ranged, has a lot of cool uh, distance arrows. The Flesh Gnawer, which was a little bit more vicious and yeah. in the front lines. The Fang of Yunogu, which was their priest. The Witherlings, the, the undead, undead version. One, yeah. yep. There's the Flind, which is the more demonic CR9 above everybody else. With which, his insane flail. Yep. You had all sorts of different kinds of cultists that follow Yunogu as well, yep. including the cult fanatic. And then you got the Lucrata and the Shusuva. Which were both very different kind of, uh, very similar to hyenas, but very different kinds of creatures. The Lucrata is its own uh, perversion of hyenas and yeah, humanity yeah. and focuses on mimicry and, and hunting. Yeah. Whereas the Shusuva is essentially a giant pet a demon that is gifted to the leader of the gnolls. And not necessarily a flind, but like a pack lord. It'll yeah. be given to a pack lord. Um, and then there's the Krokik Toek, which, which is the Krokik Toek. There's one. only the one, and it is essentially a troop transport in its stomach across the river Styx for Yinogu. So there's a lot of shit going on here. When do you use Knowles? If I ever have a horror campaign that I need a mob for. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right? If, if my world is uh, wrapped in mist and shadow and I'm going with that gothic feel... And just on the edges of the mist, you see the wolf-like creatures bounding through the woods. They're gnolls. I really like them as the World War Z kind of. Yeah. Like, and, and you always hear them before you see them. Of course. Like, you hear the, the cackling laughter of them as they move through. That is what I have gnolls for. I also like them as low-level simplistic mob monsters for people to get used to. There's no issue killing these things yeah none they they are bloodthirsty and they fight to the death they almost want to die so which one is your mvp the lacrota oh yeah hey yeah um the lacrota has that i mean i want to say the flind let's be honest i want to say the flind uh just because it's just a beast it's just a tower it's a it's a brick house. it is it is a, an amazing thing but the lacrota has that creepy aspect that mimicry yeah that that um, I can use to really royally fuck with my players. And I, I like it, man. Like, I, I I want more tense atmospheres at my table where the players are at unease with the creepiness factor, right? I want to embrace that, and the Lakota helps me in so many ways. For me, strangely enough, I'm going with the Knoll Hunter. Okay. 
Look, I like the fact that we have these utility creatures in and among the others. If one of the gnolls gets injured or is going to be left behind, the gnoll hunter executes them. Yeah. They also have these iron arrows that pin you to the ground. These are incredibly useful. I like them because they've got a unique lore aspect to their horde. Sure. They're not necessarily friends with everybody else in the horde. Not that any of these guys are buddies. But like they will turn around and straight up murder the guy beside them if it calls for it. Yeah. They're also the scouts, which means you're going to run into them more often. And they've got that weird pinning you down thing. That's going to mess with your party. And I think there's a lot of cool utility with that. I also like the party recovering those arrows and being able to use this in a limited fashion yeah. later on. Oh, yeah. From there, we went into the undead. Now, zombies and skeletons have two different functions. Zombies are not zombies the way that we're used to in the, uh, you know, pop culture. Yeah. Right. Zombies are very much about um, necromantic magic and getting back up. We covered a ton. There were zombies, Icewind, Cobalt zombies, which are those beefy kobolds that come back as undead. Yeah. Uh, there was the greater zombie, which was a beefier, scarier version. Uh, the Strahd zombies are the ones that can lose limbs like a troll does. Yep. There was the crawling claw, which is not quite a zombie, but is always in the zombie conversation. It's a, it's a fleshy undead hand. Yeah. Uh, with assassin on its quote unquote mind. Um, there's the ash zombie, which is really just a zombie that's kind of been burned. The ogre zombie... The Ankylosaurus zombie, Tyrannosaurus zombie, the Girillon zombie, Frost giant zombie, the Necromancer we covered as well. I mean, we had to at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had both the Husk zombie and the Husk zombie burster, which were really cool. But we also got the Yellow Musk creeper, which is a plant, and the Yellow Musk zombie. Remember, the Husk zombie was the one with the fog, and the Yellow creeper was the one with the plant infestation. That was Both of these things were making zombies. Yeah. So, when do you use zombies? Just straight, your basic run-of-the-mill zombie in a campaign. Communication has uh, run dry in this one town that's out in the woods or it's out in the base of a mountain. It's remote and we've heard nothing from them in a long time. Go find out why. What's going on? They are all zombies. So, so you're using them as an environmental? I mean, yeah. Right? I mean, when you got the husk zombie and you got the yellow musk zombie that are... Um, they really feed that that environmental feel. It leads you down to think zombies are going to be an environmental threat more. It, it's like you watch The Walking Dead. Why do you watch The Walking Dead? Not because I'm ten seasons in and can't stop. Yes, but you started because you wanted to see cool zombie shit, and you kept going because the interpersonal stories are so great with that shadow of zombie ever present ever present threat in it, right? Um, it, the zombies just became a set dressing more than anything else, but a very real threat of a set dressing. So that's how you think other people should use them as well. I think so. Yeah. I honestly am going to keep zombies as just that faceless, no name thing that you have to kill in level one and level two. Go clean out the thing in the graveyard. Sure. Yeah. Right. When you're at rat catcher level of, of dungeons and dragons, zombies are a pretty good challenge for your party to run into. Yeah. Um, and the fact that you can then throw weirder ones at them as you go means that you get, a for at least the first half of the game, a fun escalation. And you don't need to think too hard about it besides evil happened. So what's your MVP on the list? Honestly, uh, I think this is just because I've fought one recently. The Frost Giant Zombie. That thing is far more powerful than it has every right to be. Oh my god, those things are so scary. That 3D12... Fucking great axe attack that they have. Bro. No, thank you. Just no, 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 no. Um, and the fact of where it is in the Icewind Dale, because that's where it comes from, where it is in the Icewind Dale book, um, you could stumble upon this thing at level one. Yeah. It's a CR6. Yep. Okay, so my MVP for this is probably going to be the Tyrannosaurus zombie. Just because it's spewing <laughs> it's spewing zombies yeah. out of its gut after it dies. That's so much fun. Yeah. I like it because it's legitimately scary. I don't have a mini for it, but fuck do I want one. <laughs> Especially if I can get it to open its stomach up and then drop like other minis onto the... Oh my God, that'd be so cool. So I'm just... Whoever out there has a 3D printer, call me. We're, we're going to do this. It's going to be so awesome. Uh, skeletons, though. Skeletons are kind of mindless and they're on a loop. They have been risen for a specific reason. They have slightly more intelligence. Yep. They can use tools. They often wear armor. 
and whatnot, but we got a bunch of really interesting versions of it. We didn't just get the skeleton and the warhorse skeleton, which is pretty normal. Fifth edition also has the Minotaur skeleton, a skeletal alchemist, which was throwing alchemy at people, the frost giant skeleton, and a giant skeleton, which we had that weird dichotomy that we ranted about in the episode. Yep. Then we had the skeletal swarm, which is literally a tornado of bones, the skeletal juggernaut, which is a vaguely bipedal mass of bones that when it dies, skeletons rise out of it. And then the skeleton key, which is literally a skeleton that can climb across walls and ceilings, but the top of its head looks like a key and it unlocks things. And it's almost a a tricky trap puzzle kind of situation. Skeletons in a campaign. When do you rely on them? I uh, Skeletons are the main inhabitants of deep, long forgotten dungeons. That's what I have them as. You, I tend not to make armies with them. No, no. Well, yeah, I'm going to tell people when you're using skeletons, skeletons will fit in as a random encounter just about anywhere. Whenever you've got to go find a person that's gone missing or there's an ancient long lost whatever, skeletons are there. Right? Yeah, right. I mean, when you see the first iteration of uh, a skeleton monster in pop culture, at least in terms of movie, and you watch the Jason and the Argonaut movies, one, the skeletons hold up. It's, it's still fucking great. I love it. Um, but you see them on a remote island in some ruined, like, Acropolis level thing, and they're a very real threat, right? I, that that's, That is the home for skeletons to me. They need to be in some ruins. You don't have, you don't have effective ruins or abandoned dungeons without skeletons somewhere in there. I can see a, a low-level necromancer, not a lich, a low-level necromancer having not an army, but a decent mob of skeletons. But, yeah, I mean, I, but this is your challenge for your CR or your level twelve party. To me, skeletons are harder to come by than zombies. You think so? Oh, well, skeletons have a specific purpose that they're that they're used for. Yeah, and they're also smarter than zombies. Yeah, I just think that when it comes to skeletons, they will get stuck in that infinite loop. Sure, and they will sit there forever and ever and ever. A zombie will rot away eventually. What's your MVP? MVP. Um, the Skeletal Swarm. That thing's a freaking cover for an Iron Maiden album. Yeah. Was, I fucking love it. That was pretty cool. I gotta say, it's the key. The skeleton key for me, I, I, that right there is an entire session of batshit insanity. And I think it's a lot of fun. If you gotta hunt down three or four of these things through catacombs or underground caves or whatnot, this is not just combat. It's a combat puzzle. Yeah. And they're going to be on full retreat while you have to deal with every other kind of skeleton <laughs> in here. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, the next one that we did was uh, was Lizard Folk. Lizard Folk, this is the first time that we said the idea of reptilian brain. Yep. And we, we talked about the idea that they are emotionally detached. These are swamp dwellers who have their own society and they're not necessarily evil. However, they are cannibalistic. When it comes to Lizard Folk, we were given the base one plus a commoner. We got a scale shield, which was the militant version of them. Uh, they're shaman. There, I said it that, that way Thank for you, you Dan. I appreciate yeah. it. The render, which was a kind of bigger, scarier version of it, um, which could like really rip you apart. Uh, it rends. Thanks. The sub chief, which is the normal version of a leader. But then there would be the evil king or queen that every once in a while pops up. And it has a very demonic presence to it that will subjugate and take over yes, the lizard yeah. folk tribe. And of course, they have giant lizards, which are used as mounts. And there were a couple of different kinds of giant lizards. How often are you bringing lizard folk into your campaign? Um, criminally, not often enough. Uh, after we have done uh, these mob episodes, I kind of not even reignited. I, I had for the first time an appreciation for lizard folk. I, I honestly, I did not see a purpose for them. I always just thought they were just big kobolds and what the fuck, right? And that's just me not reading the lore behind them, which is rich and beautiful. Yeah. Um, so they they have to be more than just that tribe in the in the swamp that we don't go near because they'll kill us all. Yeah, they're extremely territorial, but the idea of uh, lizard folk on the move because they've gotten taken over by one of these kings to me is so much more intriguing than just a they are the threat that is in the swamp, right? They've got to be more than just the threat in the swamp. They are expanding their territory. They are farming and harvesting as much as they can, and they prefer the meat of intelligent humanoids. So when they're farming, they're farming you. 
The thing that I really like about them is that they don't necessarily have to be that. You can have a neutral tribe, and I think I said it in the episode too, that would befriend your party and would be allies until all of a sudden something bad happens. Yeah. And one of these kings or queens takes over. And now your party has to rescue this civilization, this small, weird, dirty, wet civilization out in the swamps that they've got to help because they were allies, right? But now these kings and queens, I mean, everything is scary now, right? Who's your who's your MVP in this? Um, the render, man. The, 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 the big, threatening, uh, like, lizard folk are kind of, they just kind of fall flat to me. The render is what I want kind of all lizard folk to be. Just large and savage and in your face. That's what I want them to be. I like the shaman or shaman if you're not Dan. Um, I, and wrong. Actually, no, we looked it up. It can be either. And the dialect. wrong. Dan, you do not have a leg to stand on for pronunciation. So... I, I really like them because of the unique way of looking at their movement. These guys were the druids, right? And we don't have a whole lot of NPC druid types. We got all sorts of priests and clerics. We got all sorts of sorcerers and wizard and warlock types. We have very few druids. And I like their ability to wild shape, right? Into um, giant alligator crocodiles. Sure, yeah. Right? Like, there was a lot of fun to be had with these guys. And I really feel like the rest of them are so barbaric and simplistic. And I don't mean savagery. I just mean that there's a level of barbarism that is not civilized with buildings necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right? That um, magic is a little bit scary to them. And we discussed that in the episode. So these guys are special. And remember, they make your renders. So Yeah. Uh, well, we went from one scaled mob to another. And we started to get into more cultish shit. And that was with the yuan T. These snake-type creatures are really inspired by uh, Egyptian and Mayan and Aztec um, iconography yeah. and whatnot. We really get a lot of that feeling and that influence in these guys, but they're pure evil. Yeah. These guys are all about sacrifice and waking up the world eater gods, and they're about gaining as much power as possible. There are different gods, different cults, hundreds of different gods, right? And so there are all of these different ways to... Uh, become bigger and more powerful. We have the UNT Pureblood, who tend to look like humans with one or two aspects that are snake-like. Yep. Uh, and they tend to infiltrate yeah. human society. They're the spies. There's the Brood Guard, which are usually humans, but any humanoid that has been captured and then twisted by an evil brew that they've been forced to drink, and then they become mindless lizard e automatons that are guarding the eggs yeah they're brood b-r-o-o-d but they drink a brew b-r-e-w so don't make them b-r-e-w-e-d guard they're not the brood guard no those are dwarves um there's the abominations which are kind of your your most common i find the abomination i just find is far more common because they're just dudes with snake heads they're fairly powerful but you can fight one of them in, in Tier 1 or a few of them all the way up through to Tier 4. Yeah, okay. Um, whereas the Malisons, and there are five different types, they all have their own unique different powers. They've all got... They're so customizable. That's the thing about the UNT is they're so customizable. Yeah. Right? And because there are so many different details and they all have their own designs and the Malisons are more powerful, you tend to run into fewer of them at a time. We also got a couple of priests uh, as well as additional priest versions one for each of their main three gods we got the mind whisperer the nightmare speaker and the pit master and then they're all sitting there trying to fight their way up to become an anathema yeah. which is the giant kaiju level uh evil multi-headed snake creature just absolutely beautiful i love it we also covered poisonous snakes the swarm of poisonous snakes the giant poisonous snakes constrictor snakes and the giant constrictor snakes. i think there's a theme there must be yeah and i think it's frogs so, Dan, when do you use you on T? When I want to use snakes? I mean, if I am looking for that ancient civilization that is biding their time and waiting for their moment to strike, I'm going to go with you on T. That is what they are there for in D&D. They are an ancient, powerful civilization that got cowed and lowered to this state of um, recluse, but they're not idle. They have their pure bloods out. They have their schemes. Um, they are arguably one of the most intelligent, strategic mobs we covered 
Honestly, I'm going to use them for subterfuge and for espionage. This is my political intrigue. Yeah. Of all of them that we've covered so far, we've got warfaring, we've got nomadic, we've got forces of nature. Living in caves, living in uh, warrens. These guys are living in pyramids and they are planning and plotting and sending in spies yeah. to, to take down kingdoms. I really like them as a mob, but they're in the background. They're, you're going to feel them before you see them. They're a long game. Yeah. That you're going to be playing against your players. So which one is your MVP? Man, I... It's the anathema, isn't it? It's got to be. Yeah, it totally is. Like, it, like that thing is just all of the terrifying I want. All of the body horror I want. All of the, like, campaign-encompassing bad guy that I want, you can find in the anathema. Honestly, I just freaking love it so much. I get all of my kaiju. We, this is the... The story arc that builds and has a giant climax and crescendo, and it fucking pays off. Yeah. That is just like, you know they're summoning that thing. And it's just, I don't know, I love it. It's amazing. We then jumped on to Lycanthropes, which is a different kind of mob, because they tend to stay fairly insular from each other. Yeah. We did werewolves, were rats, were boars, were bears, were tigers, were ravens, and were bats. Okay. We also did the animal version of each one of them, right? The wolf, rat, boar, bear, tiger, raven, bat. Yeah. Yeah. We also, well, the bat, we covered the giant bat over in the orc episodes, episodes, right? Um, And we covered the raven over in the hobgoblin episode. Yes. So we also covered the jackal wear, which is a little bit different. Those are jackals that masquerade as humans. And so it's a little bit backwards. And we covered jackals as well. We also get into shifters, which are... A little bit different now in 5th edition. They are not just the genealogy of a, of a were creature of a lycanthrope. Yeah. So they're their own unique thing that's uh, connected spiritually to the primal world. When are you using lycanthropes? And I know that they're all separate, so just hit me with the, with the broad strokes. I use werewolves when I want to have a horror campaign. I, I That's werewolves specifically, I know. But like lycanthropes... If I ever want to do the mysterious curse that is waving throughout a land or the odd hermit and his entire clutch and and why they are isolated from society, right? They might be incredibly useful or smart or benevolent, but like there's a reason why they're isolated and this is going to be the reason. That's why I use Lycanthrope. I use them when I want a murder mystery, when I want to be able to throw someone off the scent of something, when I'm sick and tired of running up to the enemy and hitting with clubs. We need to get subtle. We need to get weird. We're going to go a little off the page here. And everyone's always going to think werewolf first. And I'm going to throw that uh, that trope out there and then subvert it somehow. Yeah. So I also really like these guys as being wilderness creatures that you run into. Even the were rats, when you go down into the sewers, you're going to run into these guys. They're not a part of civilization as a general rule. What's your MVP? Uh, the were boar. Really? Yeah. I'm surprised. I I love the werebore. I I love the whole feel of them, and and not just because of like I pissed you off in the episode the bebop the bebop and rocksteady side of things. Where bears are the only good ones. They're the ones that are off on the side, except for maybe shifters. But shifters are a playable well, race. But ravens, the were ravens are good. Okay, sure. To me, the werebore are that uh, group, that family unit of like everybody's different. It, it like they're a group of friends. That all contracted the curse. The curse came upon them all because they were all in their basement playing Dungeons and Dragons at the same time when they denied the old woman at the door the drink of water and a place to rest for the night kind of level of curse, right? And um, now they all have talking furniture. And now they all have talking furniture. But like that, that, that is that group out in the woods somewhere that isn't benevolent. They, they just want to be left alone. Just, just fuck off and leave us alone. Let us do our thing, right? That is the werebore, and I like that, right? I like having them there. They're the only thing that really fits that niche to me, right? It's interesting because I my MVP is the werebear for the exact same reason. And <laughs> I'm just hitting it from the good side. Where the werebore is the leave me alone or I will fight you, the werebear is leave me alone, please. But I see that you have a need, so come in and I will help you, but do not stay here. The werebear is an apprehensive ally. We don't get enough of that. Yeah, We yeah. tend to get the here. Here's some gold. Go out and do this adventure. Or or we get bullshits like the uh, the Hippolump or whatever it is. The the hef, the, the hef, Heffalump. The, the Hollyphant. Hollyphant, yeah. Jesus. I knew we were going to get there eventually, but fuck it. 
God, I hate those things. Well, the Holly Fant and the Flump are basically the exact same fucking thing. Not even close. Oh, they, they serve the same purpose. Not even close. We're going to fight. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Mine is definitely the Werebear because you get the good aligned that still wants to be left alone. And I think that that's a really unique dynamic to play with with your NPCs. Um, we then jumped into a whole bunch of aquatic stuff. Quite a bit, yeah. So let's get into it really quickly, okay? Sahuigan or Sahuajin or Sawajin. Jesus, Tyler, goddamn. <laughs> so uh, there are a whole bunch of different ways to pronounce this, apparently. Is that going to be the last time we bring it up? Probably not. Knowing okay. this podcast, we will still be talking about this and your furniture years later. Yeah, I guess that's true. So, so with Sahuigan, we have got your basic sea monster level, kind of like we talked about the the creatures that resemble those those monsters from the depths yep. from Aquaman, right? So we've got these, or sorry, Aquaman. So we've got these special kind of um, underwater creatures, but there was not a whole lot of lore, despite the fact that we got a lot. Of different oh, types. Loves, yeah. So we had to look elsewhere. We had to look at sea elf lore. We had to look at triton lore. And then we had to look at other types to see even of the evil variety, other types of creatures out there that are aquatic creatures to find out what holes the Sahuigan are not trying to fill. So we did the basic Sahuigan, the Coral Smasher as well, which is kind of a siege monster that's taking out ships and structures. Uh, we've got the Priestess and the High Priestess who are praying to their main god. The Champion, who is a cultural idol, essentially. Yep. Uh, the Warlock of uk which is a special kind of gigantic underwater um, patron for warlocks. Super powerful. We don't really have any details on them. No. Uh, we got the Deep Diver, which has the light on it that's going to attract others. Like which, the anglerfish. Like an anglerfish. Yeah. Uh, the Blade Master, which has the blade. And, and uh, has mastered it. Yep. We also did the Baron, which leads everyone. The Wave Shaper, which does whirlpools. Essentially, that's their one trick pony. Uh, we got the Hatchling Swarm, which is uh, really a swarm of vicious little baby Groots, but they're fish. Yep. Um, and, that, and that will attack itself. As well, if mm -hmm. there's no other option. And then we also covered the Reef Shark, Hunter Shark, Shell Shark, and Giant Shark. When are you using Sahu again? When I'm in a desert campaign. Right. Yeah, this is pretty much like, here's your standard aquatic bad guy. Yeah, right? right? Like, right. there, there they, is no they, other place to put them. Right, and they serve that purpose, and there's really no others. The other evil ones are very niche. Yeah. This one kind of serves all purposes for your main aquatic bad guy which i think is why we got so many variations of them i mean we got so many variations because they they feature very prominently in ghosts of saltmarsh right how should other people think about using them if you ever like ghosts of saltmarsh if you have that raiding uh like that that aquatic force that comes out every stormy uh stormy nights to um raid that side village or that area in the ocean where there is a um, ships don't go because they just sink and no one knows why. Yeah, look, I like these things. When you're doing a pirate campaign and everyone's like, oh, pirates and ships and fighting. and uh, This is your environmental level problem. You don't yeah. go over here. You are going to end up teaming up with your enemies to survive these guys. Yes. They're coming and they're coming on mass, right? Like by the dozens. Yes. Which one stands out to you as being the MVP of this mob? I want to say the Blade Master, and only because I'm very disappointed that we didn't make more puns about the master of the fish guy and how he's probably baiting. I don't get it. He's a master baiter. Because he fishes? No, because he's baiting the party into fights, and he's really, really good at it. I don't get it. So he, he, he is a master at baiting. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that the deep diver, though, that has the lore? Oh, I guess, yeah, that would work too. So do you have a real answer? You the Baron. <laughs> the large-sized, four-armed, shark-riding Baron. The guy's badass as hell. Honestly, for me, it's the Hatchling Swarm. <laughs> it, it, it eating itself? Not just eating itself, but the idea of there being... We came up with this really cool idea of the trench yeah. in that episode full of all of the eggs and then the eggs hatching these things. I'm not kidding. If I ever, ever get players to go underwater... They're going to run into that trench. Mm -hmm. That is freaking scary. And I love the idea of the hatchling swarm. It's different from everything else. Even the sharks will avoid it. Which brings us to the Tritons. 
and the merfolk. I'm going to hit this really by the broad strokes here. Merfolk are the criminally undersupported mermaids. Yep. We got the merfolk and the merfolk salvager, and you find them in coastal waters. Yeah. The tritons are from the elemental plane of water. They're warriors that have followed the Sahuagin in and have really found their societies and st- like stuck in. What do you mean? They have stuck into the like deeps and the, and the the fight against the Sahu again. Yes, yeah, yeah. They they have carved their way into this world in the depths, in the deeps, uh, way out in the oceans, and they are driving the Sahu again towards land, out of the water. And they are the noble, if a little alien mm-hmm. uh, mentality. We and we got the shore stalker, which was an assassin, and the master of waves, which was a kind of a druidish kind of yeah, feel to yeah. it. So. When do you use these? We also have CLs, but there's no stat block for them. We yeah. talked about their society. When are you using these guys? When I want a social encounter in the water with an aquatic race. Okay, what's the difference for you? Like, when are you going to use each one of them separately? Depth. It's literally... Or, or, the- or location, right? Uh, you're going to encounter tritons in saltwater. You're going to encounter merfolk in your lagoons or your your uh, shallow bays. Right, might still be salt water, but like you'll never find a uh, triton in a lake. You might find some merfolk in a lake. That's fair. And seals, uh, on harbor and coastline villages. They're they're they are fishermen. They are surfer dudes. Like that's what I do with sea elves. We also then got the Muro, which are directly linked with the merfolk, because they're ancient, twisted by the abyss. Uh, they're original version that ended up getting sucked in there was uh, seduced by an idol of Demogorgon. Yeah. They've been driven insane and now they're back. They're large size and they're out for blood. When it comes to the Tritons, the Merfolk and the Murrow, when the Murrow we got just the basic one and then Matt Mercer gave us a shallow priest. So we have six here. Is there a standout for you? Um, The shallow priest. You like the shallow priest? I do like the shallow priest. Um, Honestly, I, I also kind of want to say just the base Murrow. Right? Or Muro. Um, I, I, I like the large size twisted horror of the seas. Especially playing them in conjunction with merfolk, which are horribly under supported and, and provided for. So, um, again, if I'm having an aquatic themed campaign, I, I want to have the Muro. If I have coastal villages that my party, you know, sets up camp in for an extended period of time, you're going to have to deal with Muro. Right? And and that Shallow Priest is badass. It's just badass. I, li- I also like the fact that they do act almost like a society. It's not well supported in the, no, no. In the lore. But they do have borders to their territory that the Sahuagin probably stay out of. So that you know you're going from bad to worse one way or the other when you're crossing that border. For me, my favorite one is going to be the Triton Shore Stalker. Okay. I just really like the assassin that comes from the waves. People don't even really know that the person got assassinated. They just go missing they're just they've disappeared that ship out there the the small fisherman's boat was just empty nobody knows what happened maybe it was sahuagin could have been murrow no one's thinking of tritons yeah it's just really cool to have that assassin level in like a neutralish kind of of society be a, a threat that you're not expecting it's going to come out of the blue literally <laughs> nice and, and is going to Add a new level of complexity to your underwater politics. And the last one, of course, that we covered was the Kuotoa. <laughs> which included the whip, the monitor, and the arch priest, as well as the base, the base one. Kuotoa, yeah. um, and the monitor, of course, keeps the slaves in line. The arch priest worships the gods because these guys are creating gods with their brains. They're ugly little underdark fish things. I just... God, I love to hate the Kuotoa. So, when do you use them? <laughs> when I've when I've written myself into a plot hole and need a reason. Yeah, okay, fair <laughs> enough. For me, for me, these are short four session arcs that yeah, I'm gonna sure. do. Yeah. And like, hey guys, we're gonna do a one shot, but it's gonna last a month. So we're gonna do every consecutive week, we're gonna just yep. run into these guys and fight with this and try to keep their crazy, insane god from coming into existence. It's gonna be a little bit funny, a whole lot weird, and kind of smelly. Yeah. So which one is your favorite? What's your MVP? Uh the the, the Archpriest. It's the only mob we've seen where I'm okay with cure uh that has cure wounds. Um I I like its 
just on unhin- like it's kind of hard to pick between the four of them to be honest i love all kuatoa you know what i was i have changed my answer twice already um i'm gonna say the base one it has the sticky shield yeah that's a lot of fun and no one's gonna expect that at that crazy low level like, these things are just gonna steal your weapons they never tell you where the sticky comes from either they just have buckets of chum lying around dan yeah just massive chum buckets on that note we're gonna head to a short break did you hit record? Yeah, go ahead. So, as some of you have noticed, obviously, Dan and I launched a bit of an informal side project where we go through one of the Dungeons & Dragons publications at a time and determine the pros and cons and our overall thoughts. And the first one we did was Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden. We went over almost every page, covering moderate spoilers for the adventure without giving the ending away. We covered things that interest players or may be useful to Dungeon Masters to get inspiration from. I always love going through the monsters and the items and the player options. I really enjoyed seeing all the different forms of the Frost Maiden and investigating everything about her frosty lair to her maiden head. Dan? What the fuck, man? I need you to take these commercials way more seriously. I show up every time with the utmost professional attitude. Ah! What? You? Professional? Yes. Professional what? Dick? At least I'm not an amateur dick. I don't... What? I... What? What? What is your problem? What's an amateur dick? Well, I don't know. Obviously, by definition, it's a dick that doesn't get paid. Does your dick normally get paid? I mean, it should. Well, I'm not sure that Canada's ready to reintroduce the penny, Adam. Go fuck yourself, Dan. <laughs> it should be getting paid in pounds, if you get what I mean. You can pound pounds. it on your own time. We're trying to record a commercial. Okay, anyway, dick, we're going to periodically continue working our way through new releases as they come. Gross. As well as discussing some of the published material from Wizards of the Coast that has already hit the shelves. There's a lot of info out there for 5th edition, but not every DM or player knows which book to pick up next, or what to expect from an adventure module. After all, there's some great additions to the library, and then there's, well, Rick and Morty vs. D&D. This series is going to be sporadic and unscheduled, so keep your eyes out for these, and let us know if you agree with our assessments. We hope that you'll be able to use the series as a guideline for which books deserve your attention for your own personal needs as a D&D player, but keep in mind that they're going to be full of moderate spoilers for the adventures, and they aren't meant to tear into specific mechanics or stat blocks. As we go on, you'll be able to find previous Legend Lore episodes in a playlist on our YouTube channel, or check out the episode guide to see what books we've already covered by looking at the post on r slash it's a mimic on Reddit. Now... Let's get back to the episode, shall we? Fuck, one of these days we're going to record a normal fucking commercial. I highly doubt it. Well, whose fault is that? Mostly yours. Disagree. Okay, so we went over all of those different kind of mobs. We did 20 episodes of them and far more than just 20 creature types. The one that we didn't cover as well was the Bullywugs, which we did that episode way back when. Yeah. But they really only have, I think, three different kinds of creatures. And we covered them at the time. Yeah. So let's talk about the mobs that are out there that exist technically that we could have done episodes on and decided not to. And we'll, we'll talk about why. Sure. So first and foremost, there's the drow. That's the big one. There are so many different kinds of drow. And they're so intrinsically built into demonic lore that there is no way to have a simple conversation about them. Especially that format that we were using. Yeah. We'd have been doing five episodes on just drow. Minimum minimum there's so much to have there we will find a better way to have that conversation stay tuned there's also the duragar who have a ton of stat blocks yeah it, there's a surprising amount of them you can thank icewind dale for some of that we have more duragar than we have dwarves yeah by and, a sight and i really like the duragar as well they're going to get their own spotlight at some point and then the other one which you may be surprised should be included in the mob discussion, is ogres. There's a whack of different kinds of ogres in there, Mm. and they all do a very unique and original thing, but most of them are in and among the other mobs. So these are more of utility tanks that you add to your mobs as opposed to just having a an army of ogres have you noticed how in the monster manual they also tend to be the the one creature that they use to explain in art how powerful a monster is like look at the black pudding picture 
of an ogre slowly being eaten by black pudding. Oh yeah, and you also get the the ogre zombie. Like you start to get the idea of ogres being very prevalent. They're all over the place and they're useful. Yeah. We also have all the playable races: elves, dwarves, warforged, tiefling, grung. Even there are so many that are out there. We have a series on playable races. We will continue to do that there. At which point we will talk about them. There are some monster stat blocks for some of these. Think about the Warforged and the Grung, for example. But if you understand the society and the civilization like a player would, then you are well ahead of the game for running their monster stats. So we'll be covering them in future episodes. Then there are the weird ones like the plants, um, animated and awakened uh, creatures that are, you know, animals and and objects and whatnot. We have oozes and some beasts. We could sit there and talk about how there are buffalo that move in a pack, but there's not a whole lot to say about these things. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. They tend not to have strategies in and of themselves, or they're like veggie pygmies and myconids, um, which have some lore, but not as much as as you might expect. Not enough to warrant a full episode. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are just the NPCs, the citizens of the world out there that have their own random motivations. These are anything from the Simic hybrids of Ravnica, which we don't have a whole lot of stat blocks for, but they've got their own unique perspective on the world. There are a million different kinds of cultists. There's the hoplites from Theros that they all fit these these specific roles within the societies that they're already a part of. Yeah. And then, of course, they're the ones that are just too broad to cover as mobs. Like, you can run fiends, elementals, monstrosities, undead, and celestials. You can, you can group them. You can have a whole squad of deva. Or a whole full crazy rank and file of devils and whatnot. Yeah. But every single time you do this is going to be slightly different. With slightly different motivations depending on which god or archdevil they represent. uh, Who's leading the army. And that's more kind of general tactics. Or you have to go right into their monster description themselves. To figure out what purpose they serve. And they're wildly varied within their own creature type. And then honestly there are the ones that... Are they sound like they should be classic regular monsters? They should have mobs. I think they have had mobs. The the mob treatment of getting you know the leader and then the advisor and then there's a the militant one and the yeah. the base level and the commoner and, and it feels like we should have these different versions for these kind of monsters, but we just don't get anything. They're not classic enough. It's like the Murrow. The Murrow almost got that treatment. It got a basic Murrow and then a shallow priest. But that's it. And we know there's a society kind of. The Merfolk, what is there a is there a regent, a king? They say there's kings. What's that stat block look like? Yeah. Right? So, and there are a lot of things out there. The Thrycreen, Grimlocks, Chul, Fire Newts, Measles, Mongrel Folk, Quagoths, Exvarts, Troglodytes, Sferf Neblin. You say Exvarts, hey? What do you say? Zvarts. That just annoys me. Really? Yeah. Zvart. It sounds to me... It the, sounds, sound, the sound you make when you stick your uh, stick a fork in an electrical socket. Zvart. That, that is the sound that my mom makes when she's describing Star Wars noises. Oh, yeah, zvart, zvart. Yeah. yeah, right. Like, that. that's what I think of. So, the last group that you're probably sitting there going, well, why didn't you go over these? We're going to go over them. They're coming up. Yeah. Um, they're getting their own portfolios episodes as we go through each one of them. Uh, that's giants, illithids, hags, trolls... It's coming. These guys get their own big episodes. Each one of these will get multi-part episodes yeah. to go through because they have such rich lore to them. And they tend to just be too powerful. To If you run into a mob or a coven or a illithid society, you're, you're, you, you're toast. Yeah. I don't know why we get rules for an illithid colony because you should never. You should <laughs> never. never be there. Yeah. So... There are six mobs that almost got the appropriate treatment. They have a number of different creatures involved, but the lore is not deep enough and it's not varied enough to warrant a full episode for them. So Dan and I split it three and three, and we're going to cover them really, really, really broad strokes here. And let's uh, grab our dice and roll initiative. Sure. I got a natural one. I got two ones, which is an 11. Um, So the first one that I'm going to jump in on is uh, Mephits. Mephits feel like they should be a mob, but they're not quite. These are your small, neutral evil elementals from the Monster Manual that represent the hybrid elementals of dust, ice, magma, mud, smoke, 
and steam. Mm -hmm. They're usually found surrounded by the elements that they're attached to, and some of them have the ability to blend into their environments, but not all of them do. They're CR half or quarter and have lower stats than you'd expect because they're nasty surprises for low-level parties because they each have an elemental death burst mechanic to fuck up your player's day. They don't work with each other, although I can see them operating in little packs of their own kind to harass adventurers that are level six or lower. That's and I mean and that's how I'd use them. There's they're like little little imps that are not as interesting as imps mm-hmm. are. Um, they're not really worthy of a long term story arc, let alone a campaign. You stumble upon them, they harass you, they blow up, you hurt, you heal, you move on. Yeah. What do you got, Dan? So the first one um, that I thought was criminally um, missing from a lot of these mob episodes are Modrons. I fucking love Modrons. Modrons, uh, which you'll find exclusively in the Monster Manual, are the armies and the main populace of Mechanus um, and the servants of its leader, Primus. They are the ultimate form of constructs. They have limited self-awareness outside of their normal duties. Um, There is only the collective when it comes to Modrons. So... They fit the mob idea perfectly. They are designed for that. To the point where there is no real I when it comes to a Modron. It is we. There are five ranks of Modron. um, Or types, depending on how you do it. With a possible sixth in the mysterious Primus. There's the Monodrone, the Duodrone, the Tridrone, the Quadrone, and the Pentadrone. Each is a fixed number of drones within its own rank. To the point where if a Quadrone dies, a... Tri-drone will be elevated, and then a duodrone will be elevated to a tri-drone, and then a monodrone will be elevated to a duodrone, and then a new monodrone will come to exist. As a whole is created, the necessity fills exactly, itself. right. Um, they range from CR 8th to CR 2, and go up like a monodrone's an 8th, a pentadrone is a CR 2. So it's 8, quarter, half, eight, 1, Eight, quarter, two. half, 1, 2. Yeah, it's just... I've heard in previous editions, there's lore out there that they can get up to like, there's a dodecadrone yes. and stuff. Like yeah. it keeps going, but you'll never run into them because never. they're a mechanist. No. Um, they also have this interesting thing where their faculty for communication only exists with the the rank either directly below or directly above, not beyond, right? They understand that the pentadrone exists, but they have no ability to communicate with it if it's a monodrone or duo drone or tri uh, drone even. Okay, um, they also have two fun mechanics. They one disintegrate when they die, leaving behind only their weapons, which um, I would think is because the Primus doesn't want these guys to be backwards engineered. And to a unit, even the monodrones, which are CR eighth, they have true sight. Wow. Well, they they are order. Embodied. They are order in a, uh, embodied. Well, that brings me to my next one, which is Chaos Embodied. Okay. And that's the Fae. And that is an entire creature type, but there's not a whole shit ton of them. And they feel like they should be working together, especially because we get rumors of the Seelie and Unseelie court, but no evidence of it. Mm -hmm. There isn't enough about Fae in 5th edition for my liking, although there seems to be another addition to the list of Fae in just about every other book that comes out. The weird and bizarre world of the Feywild, which we covered in our Feywild episode, was so undersupported in the Monster Manual that the most powerful Fey we got in that book was the Green Hag at CR3. Yeah. But between the New Hags and Volos and Eberron, the CR9 and CR18 entries in Ravnica, the Sea Fury from Wildmount, and the Eladrin from Mordenkainen's, we're starting to get some more heavy hitters. For the most part, though... This is a creature type that sits in Tier 1 and Tier 2 and tends to be a low-level threat. Yeah. Except for Covens of Hags, Eladrin Settlements, Seder and Darkling Conclaves, and Sprite Villages, you tend not to run into more than a few of these guys at a time. They're not a true mob. They're little gangs, if that. And while they may interact with each other, most Fey aren't really team players. They tend to stick to small groups of their own kind, even though we've gotten scraps of the idea of the Seelie and Unseelie courts, like I said. They seem to be great for random encounters and memorable side quests, but unless you're gallivanting through the Feywild, which we don't have a whole lot of info about, or pissing off hags, which is not recommended, nope. most Fey are just passing low-level threats or curiosities. For me, the, one of the other ones we didn't cover are the Blights. 
Blights are something that I've always overlooked. Even as someone who's been in this game for over 20 years, they, they're new to me. And when I look through what their lore is, holy shit was I wrong. They are some of the coolest lore possible. They are evil, sentient plant creatures that were created at the death of a vampire whose evil was so great his blood corrupted the stake used to kill him, and when an evil druid planted that corrupted wood, it sprouted into something called the Gulthius tree, Gulthius being the name of the vampire, which is where the blights are from. The blight pass on this evil, hoping to create more of the Gulthius trees and spread that corruption of nature. They are directed by their Gulthius trees as a center point to their hive mind. Okay? There are three varieties. There is the twig blight, needle blight, and vine blight, which are respectively CR 8th, quarter, and half. Now, they are blind beyond 60 feet, but within that 60 feet, they all exclusively have blind sight. They are immune to blindness and deafness and can understand common, although only the vine blight can speak it. Twig and vine blights also can pull a drax and are so motionless they are otherwise indistinguishable from a dead shrub or tangle of lifeless vines. These things are badass, evil, blood-drinking vampire bushes. They're badass. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. I'm yeah. surprised you'd never played with them before. No, never. So, kind of in the same realm uh, is a different kind of plant monster, and that's the myconid. Myconids are from the monster manual, and they're lawful neutral. They're a mushroom person who's usually found in the underdark. There are only three stat blocks, one each for their young, adult, and leader varieties, which go small, medium, and large. And they range from CR 0 to 2. They have a couple of neat abilities, like the ability to share a consciousness and dreams with each other. Oh, that's cool. As well as the ability to use their spores to infect any corpse of a large-sized flesh and blood creature and animate the corpse to be what's called a spore servant. There's a template in the monster manual for how to infect any creature that matches this description. And although the highest CR level we've seen has only been a Chul Spore Servant at CR 4, in Out of the Abyss is where we ran into yeah. that, Zerial, Grazd, Frazer, Blue, and Moloch are all technically possible to animate this way. What? They are all large flesh and blood creatures. Solar Angels, Pit Fiends, Young Dragons, Beholders. These are all able to be brought back albeit at a very minimal level, they do not have a lot of power. And that just screams plot hook to me. Yeah. Especially with a big enough and powerful enough myconid colony nearby. Cool. Well, we're going to go from your fun guys to my fun guys. And that is Vegapygmies and their favorite pets, the Thorny. The you can pygmy. find the Vegapygmies in Tomb of Annihilation or go to Volos. That's where they've kind of collected them as well. They, of course, are fungal creatures, but... Um, they often are called moldies or mold folk. And the reason is they grow out of the corpses that succumb to a very specific kind of mold, that being russet mold. Now, russet mold is a poison that is a DC 13, uh, constitution save. And you take 2d6 poison damage at the start of every one of your turns. And should this damage take you to zero, you die. You don't get death saves. You die. Yikes. Within 24 hours, if you have died from russet mold, um, depending on your size, vegapygmies will spring from your corpse. If, cool. If you are small, one will. If you are medium, two will. If you are large, four will. Do you see how this is going? Yeah. Yeah. If it is a beast uh, succumbs to the uh, russet mold, which likes warm, wet, and dark areas. So do I. Knew you were going to go there. Anyways, they will be uh, spawn thornies, which I'm trying to hit that th th very, very hard. I bet you are. Anyways, um, all Vegapygmies have limited sentience, the highest in score being a seven for these guys. And their language is nothing more than some hisses, clicks, and thumps on the body, but it is a unique language. Their CRs range from quarter for the base uh, pygmy, but CR2 for the chief, and with a thorny being a CR1. They prefer a diet of fresh meat, blood, and bone, and are almost all small, small size, except for the thorny, which is medium. What alignment are they? They are evil. Cool. Yeah. I always thought Vegapygmies were just like a, you know, just a neutral party in the woods. Nah, man. These things are malicious. They want to eat you, and they want to eat you fresh. So do I. 
Anyways, speaking of things that concern me, thornies are the bestial relatives to veggie pygmy and are named so because they have they are covered with thorns. So much that any creature grappling one of these medium-sized fungus monsters takes 1d4 piercing damage. Now, the one last thing that is interesting about them, and we didn't see this with your myconids, were all veggie pygmies, all of them, even the thorny, are resistant to lightning and piercing damage. I don't know why. They just are. Well, the piercing damage makes sense. Does it? Well, I could stab a mushroom. Sure, but I think these guys are built more like like mold and trees. Can you stab mold? Can you, like what happens when you use a oh. pin on fungus? The, the bludgeoning and the slashing is going to be more effective. There is some rule sets in Volos of how to take care of the russet mold. It's hard to get rid of that shit, man. You can't cut it away. It is immune to physical damage. You have to use radiant or necro- uh, uh, radiant or fire damage, I believe, and necrotic will just make it worse. I like that. That sounds that sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, before we move on to talk about more kind of generalities as well, then of those six, which one was your favorite? I, I, I fucking love Veggie Pygmies. The Veggie Pygmies are your favorite? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hard-pressed. Veggie Pygmies are Mo- Modrons. I love them both. And both Modrons have always been part of my campaigns. Veggie Pygmies will start being part of my campaigns now. <laughs> Especially with Tetanus. They, they line up with Tetanus so well. Tetanus being, of course... My intelligence great weapon that is... Great sword that is in all of my campaigns that yeah. seeks to corrupt and consume and decay. For me, I have to say, just because it's so widespread, I can't go wrong with Fae. I get everything from hags to sprites. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm going to find, no matter what, I will find a way to include Fae somehow in every campaign I do. And they're weird enough where someone with your level of imagination and creativity can use them to just be bonkers wild. Like the one that eats hair. What the hell is that? The Corred? I love the Corred. That's a lot of fun. (laughs) Okay, so I just want to remind everybody that stuck with us for all of these mob episodes. I want to remind you guys that this has been breaking the mold. Speaking of mold. um, We've been breaking the mold a little bit. We are going to start going back to our regularly scheduled program here. Thanks for sticking with us this long. I know it's been crazy COVID times and whatnot. And... We have definitely been feeling the hurt over here. Yeah. Um, and we appreciate every one of you that has been listening. If you are just checking us out for the first time, thank you as well. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, you could always reach us on our socials, Instagram, Facebook, on Reddit at r slash it's a mimic, as well as you could reach us through, you know, good old fashioned email at info at it's a mimic dot com. Any questions you guys ask, they'll get an- added to the mailbag episodes where we will roll dice and discuss them regardless of what the question is. We answer literally every question that comes to us. Eh, Much to Dan's chagrin. Yeah, some of, some of them are kind of blue. Anyways, uh, thank you guys so much for uh, listening and, and taking part. Be sure to check out the website as well. And, I mean, take a look at the merch. We've got merch on there. Okay, so we've talked about these organized groups that are going to end up in combat with you. That's why we've done all of these episodes so far. Let's start looking at kind of the general insights on what we would do that we can apply to just about every one of them. Lycanthropes and the undead are kind of their own unique, weird things, but everything else should kind of have an application of, let's say, um, an organized army, right? So there is a basic organization to them. So let's grab a dice and roll initiative. And I want to hear your thoughts about a couple of general strategies you use for organized armies. Sure. A natural one. I got a 10. So here's the first thing. As we've seen, most mobs have a basic combatant, like a goblin, and variants of a similar CR that focus on a ranged attack, like a knoll hunter does to a knoll. Militant strength, like cobalt dragon shields, or stealth, like the orc red fang of Shargas. We tend to get a lieutenant type creature, like the Kuatoa whip. An advisor creature that usually casts spells and often represents the religious side of the mob, like the Yuan-Ti priest. And maybe a special shock troop, like the Render or the Sahuagan wave shaper. Then there's the big boss, a couple of animals that complement the arrangement, and maybe a mount. If you pay attention, you can see how these creatures fit within the society in a unique way. You really do need to see the entire overview of this society... To get the full flavor of them. If we didn't know about the nurtured one. And the hand of Yertris. The orcs would be incomplete. Yeah. 
Not every orc horde has it, but there is a spot for it there. And so this answers the question, what do they do with their sick? Mm -hmm. We get different insights through the different mobs and we can compare and contrast them against each other to see which one fits what role within the D&D, specifically the Forgotten Realms yeah. landscape. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's how the ranks of an army are built. So when I'm looking at an organized army, I'm looking at what their ranks say about their tactics. So you have the more bestial orcs who have religious sex, but not... Yeah, they do. Yeah, <laughs> they do. But no real rank and file, and they will in- attack en masse like a rolling wave of death. However, hobgoblins with their captains, blades, and various members of the host will attack in waves and in file, right? So being able to tell what rank and what structure that army is tells me what their tactics will be. Like how fast all of the gnolls are. Like they're built around speed. Right, yeah. Where, whereas the kobolds seem to be built around ingenuity. And and the kuatoa will just... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Remember to manage your leadership. You got to keep your leaders alive as long as possible, using their level of intelligence and willpower to guide the others. Yeah. A goblinoid host may only be as fast as its slowest goblin, but it can function as brilliantly as its hobgoblin warlord if it's disciplined enough. Just have a plan for what to do with the leader, the alpha, the boss, the priest, or the champion, or whatever, and what to do when they fall in battle. From the leader side, I want everybody to realize that for an organized army to exist, be they big or small, they all require supplemental forces to keep that army going. For every dozen foot soldiers, there's a cook or a medic or a maid or a stable hand back in the camp. Um, if you if you don't want to take out a full army face on, you cut off its supply line and watch them, in some cases, like the Kuatoa or Noel, literally start to eat each other. I don't think there's a whole lot of cooks back into the camp for gnolls. For no, oh, no, no, they're eating raw, right? But uh, they don't have a whole lot of civilians. But you're right. For the most part, even the Sahuigan, the Yuan Ti, the lizard folk, there's a settlement, there's a civilization behind the front line somewhere, right? So uh, for every organized army, there is a backbone that if you are a small party of four to five uh, powerful individuals you're going to have a much larger effect than trying to face the army down. And it's easier to DM. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, isn't there? Okay, so let's shift then from the organized army to the roving hordes. Yep. Right? These are your orcs and your again to a degree. Knolls. Knolls for sure, yeah. definitely. We're going to keep the same initiative. Uh, you just want me to keep the natural one? Okay. Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. So for me, the first thing that comes to my mind with the roving horde is speed and mobility. Look at their ability to move. If they have the opportunity to get a swim speed or a fly speed or whatever it is, they are going to prefer that method and have real advantages. You know if it can climb, you're going to put it in a place with vertical options. Sure, yeah. Right, so look at their speed. Look at how fast they're moving too. Those knolls are fucking fast. They will cover the ground. There's nothing you can do. Those sharks for the Sahuagin, you don't stand a chance of outrunning them. By the time that you are in combat, by the time that initiative is rolled, your ability to escape is gone. As a DM, I'm prepping them that way. Mm -hmm. Which means, if I end up in a death spiral, it's going to get out of control very quickly. Because of the speed at which they move. Especially when you get relentless Right or rampage where you're able to move up to half your speed, or if there's a blood frenzy, then you can go over in that direction twice as fast. There's a lot of crazy shit going on with some of these mob um, abilities that they get, which is outright frightening. I want to say there's one exception to the speed rule when it comes to these roving hordes, and it is persistence. When you are running through, uh, and I'll take this as my next one, when you are running a roving horde, there, there are really two types. There is the rolling wave of destruction that is here and gone in an instant. Like and gnolls. Le- like gnolls. But zombies, man, by the thousands, they're not moving quick. Especially the, the husk zombie, which is coming with that fog. Yeah, right? They are going to come slowly, but they are coming, right? Gross. 
Would you prefer I say they are arriving? No, that's worse. That's that's worse. The climax of the battle <laughs> is well, going to just ejaculate all over the... F- Wait, no. No. Ah, you get my point. This may be over premature... No, no, hold on. no that's still there. bad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the other thing that I really want to keep in mind with a roving horde... Is, is they're going to come to a head? Is you have to understand the motivation for them, right? The thing about roving hordes as opposed to organized armies... Armies are about territory, but hordes are not. No. They have a different mentality. And you can see it. Gnolls operate differently than orcs do, who operate differently from zombies. And these are the hordes that you see moving through. And the Sahuagin are attacking for supplies. The orcs attack because they are gnolls. Superstition. Right? Superstition is a big factor. But gnolls are there for, for carnage and destruction and food. Yeah. And zombies are there because that's what we fucking do. Right? And like, there is a different reason. And again, orcs will treat halflings different than they will treat elves. Know exactly what you're getting into with these attacks. Yeah. Um, Also understand that with the different mentality of the um, horde, the, the refuse, the leavings, the, the, the effects from their movement is going to be different as well. And each one of them will leave something behind, whether it's an orc who is finishing the looting and, and wrapping that up or the no witherlings from behind who are just springing out these skeletons in their wake, causing more destruction to the veg pygmies. If they're moving through in a horde of veg pygmies, all of the things infected and killed with the russet mold are going to then get back up as more veg pygmies re uh, upping and, and, and reinforcing their armies there's going to be some sort of stragglers behind them and as a dm you got to be aware of that and as a player you might be able to exploit that there's definitely the opportunity for some exploration yeah and to put some clues together let's go from the shit that's straggling behind to the stuff that's out in front of this army or the horde or the mob and that's the scouts okay scouts don't want to get caught The whole point is that they're getting information and returning it back. So, using effective scouts against your players may seem like cheating. If they're effective, they're not getting caught. Using smart scouts in a fair way is a balancing act of telegraphing their presence, being a threat, and getting caught. Sometimes you need that, sometimes you don't. If you see scouts, uh, hobgoblin scouts in the distance that are turning around and going back towards the goblinoid host... You have to chase them down. That is a major issue. If you are able to capture them, you can get information from them. But do you as a DM want to have every scout in existence get captured? No. Do you want to have your enemies sometimes get the upper hand? Yes. (laughs) How do you do that without this balancing act? And the simple answer is you don't. You have to have it be fair. And you will know at your table what your players will think is fair. It's not about what you as a dungeon master think is fair. It is about your party. When it comes to scouts, I just want to say, knowing you, you, you said that a scout is there to gain information. That is their entire role. Knowing that balance is important, but also knowing why they're there is important. And any sort of information gatherer who is going to report back to some sort of home base has got to be smart. And scouts are going to be some of the smartest people in their armies and fast and stealthy it is very very likely that the only reason why your party has found a scout is because they found you first and they want to see what you can do if you manage to stumble upon them you have to understand that when a scouting party goes missing when you have wiped it out there will be another party to find out what happened to them one scout gives you the idea that there will be others it should amp up their paranoia and so that's why i like to use scouts as hostages and prisoners of war and whatnot i also like the fact that scouts are also uh they tend to be very nature-based generally speaking generally speaking and friends here's here's a little tactic for your scouts because they're nature-based they will have pets they will have animals that are along with them your party suddenly becomes under attack by a bunch of hyper aggressive wolves or hyper aggressive rats or dog whatever it is You don't know why, but they're hyper-aggressive and they're attacking you. The reason? They have been commanded to attack you by some scouts who want to see where your capabilities are. And they've already got other goblins or gnolls or whatever heading back to inform 
of what is going on, right? If if you get attacked by a bunch of rats and suddenly you're getting hit with fireballs, they're probably going to leave you alone. True. Right? Or if they're not going to leave you alone, they may send something else a little bit stealthier than even the scout. And that's an assassin. Assassin. So when I think about the assassin type characters, we do have a few of them. Of course, the UNT are just fucking rife with assassins. Yeah. But we get the uh, Orc Fang of Shargas. We got the... Um, the Hobgoblin, Iron Shadow. like yeah. There are definitely a lot of mob creatures that are able to get in behind your front lines and get to you while you are asleep. Yeah, the Trenton Shore Stalker is going to fit in here too. Exactly. Aim for NPCs. I'm telling you, Dungeon Masters out there, you want to hit the NPCs, the mounts, the sidekicks and pets. Assassins are only effective and memorable when they assassinate. Someone's got to die. Let them get a kill. But do not do it to a player character unless that player is in on it and is retiring a character. Yeah. Or you have telegraphed this over and over and over and you just are tired of hitting them upside the head and saying, hey, you're being hunted by bounty hunters and they are still sleeping out in the open and not giving a shit and we're not setting watch. Yeah, it's time to, to kill one. Yeah. Right. You're on session eight of this. It's time for there to be blood. And to be completely fair... If your party is setting up that jump for the assassin, they will flee. Assassins are going to be your smartest. So if they get in over their head, they will recognize it before you recognize that you have the advantage and they will get the fuck out. They're not going to take risks. No. They do not want to be caught. They want you, they want your friends to wake up to find you dead with a blade in your chest. Yeah. Right. And it should be anonymous. The moment that even their anonymity is threatened might be enough for them to get the fuck out. So, we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit, Dan, about those that are left behind. Some of the evidence and whatnot. Let's talk about the creatures that are left behind. The wounded, the lost, the abandoned. These are excellent sources of information for a party. But they may strain the morality and alignment of the party when they've got to deal with them. These are great for hostile social encounters, or at the very least, for laying traps. I really like leaving the um, nurtured one of mm-hmm. Yertris back. These uh, cobalt underlings that are wounded that only have three hit points left. Your um, your husk zombie bursters that are slower than the other zombies. Because when you run into them, these things will explode. They will do damage. These are the, the actual literal traps left behind. Yeah, I, I just wanted to build on that with like... I mentioned witherlings earlier. Cobalt strapped with IEDs. Like whatever... Or sorry, or goblins strapped with IEDs. Either one. Like, that is going to be the level of shenanigans you get with the strang- uh, stranglers. Stragglers. Stragglers. But also remember, if you have a horde, if you have one of these large-scale armies, they may just cull the weak. Well, the gnolls specifically are, are going to do that. I would see Sahawagan doing that as well. Yeah, I can see that. Lizard folk. Lizard folk you, definitely will eat you. You've been, you've eat been injured. I will eat you now. Yep. You are now food. You have no more use for me. Even you on tea will add you to the sacrificial pile, right? Yeah. Um, so there are definitely times they would do that. But when you come to the less intelligent or the, the less aware, I'm thinking Kuatoa, um, even zombies and skeletons, if they're slower, if they're straggling behind, they will be left. And they may still be able to do just as much damage, but you're hitting one or two of them at a time. Sure. Now, once you have captured a straggler, they become a prisoner of war. Hostages, captives, and prisoners are interesting ways to strain your party's resources. By making them give up spell slots on non-combat spells like Zone of Truth, or using the end of their rope to tie up the hands of seven cowering kobolds. Mm -hmm. If you're going to give the party a prisoner of war, then look at the resources that are being used, and then attack those resources. (laughs) <laughs> That's where the drama comes from. Yeah. Most people sit back and they say, okay, we've got a prisoner of war. We've cast zone of truth on them. And the DM says, okay, well, nothing happens. Who's setting up watch? No, you burned a spell slot. They had to use up a resource. Dungeon masters attack the character sheet. We did a whole episode on it. Mm-hmm. If they are sitting there trying to cast uh, speak to dead over and over and over again to get information from all of these different corpses to find out what happened. And the cleric is now without spell slots above level one. Now is the time to hit them with the mob. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I also like uh, flipping that and seeing what the mob does when your party are the prisoners of war. Um, Don't be afraid to make your PCs prisoners of war. If the party breaks off more than they can chew, 
the vast majority of the mobs presented in the previous six months worth of episodes will enslave before they ever straight up murder. Now, Sahawagan and uh, Knowles, notwithstanding. Undead and lizard folk may, may just fucking eat you. Yeah, but your PCs have class levels and are far better than your average commoner for manual labor. Even your wizard. They're going to matter more for sacrifices next full moon. Exactly, right? So if you uh, made that unfortunate DM mistake of overextending your party or overextending the CR that you're fighting, like, oh no, here's a CR6, you level twos. Ha ha ha, take it, right? Well, remember, uh, we just discovered in the last episode, as we were going over the Kuatoa, that you any melee attack, it doesn't matter if it is magical, any melee attack can do non-lethal damage. Mm -hmm. When you end up in the death spiral and you're like, well, shit, the first guy went down and is doing death saves. The next two have four hit points you know, left a piece. It's time to start capturing. Yeah. And, and knocking out means you are below, you're stable. You're not dying, but you're unconscious. And there are rules for that in the source material, in the player's handbook. So... The last thing that we see a lot of are these champions or advisors, these uh, spellcasters or lieutenants, these not super bosses, yeah, but they're going to be on the front lines. You're going to run into a lot of them. These are going to be your Eye of Groomsh. These are going to be your um, Sahuagin champion. Right? Yeah. So very few mob members will fight to the death, especially if their side is losing. Having a cultural idol a religious figure or a slave driver in their midst should keep them from retreating a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Retreat is on the table when you're dealing with mobs. Keep that in mind when you design the ferocity of your encounters. You can be overwhelming, but the moment you drop to 80%, everyone runs away. They will stick around longer, uh, maybe to only 40% of the people are, are left standing if there's a champion in their midst. Mm -hmm. But maybe the champion falls early. And then everybody runs away, even though only one person dropped, right? Think about how these lieutenants, these leaders that are not the bosses, these are not your warlords. These are your icons. These are your uh, heroes. Your malisons. Yeah. yeah. Think about what's going to happen when these things drop in combat, how the rest of your mob is going to be affected. Well, I, I like to put myself in the frame of mind of that champion and be like, the only reason why a champion is a champion is because its deeds have been reported right um they got their positions not just because of the great deeds that they may have done but because those great deeds were corroborated by witnesses they want to leave a word of their greatness and that pride avarice or whatever you want to call it is exploitable by your party so if a fight is going well the the champion is going to try to strike that pose is trying going to try to build up its reputation more right or on the inverse if a champion is starting to die is is losing that fight they might throw some of their meat shields that they brought along with them in the path between them and the party so that they could get out right i ended up doing that actually just a little anecdote i ended up doing that when the party was fighting a whole horde of kobolds i had a displaced Cobalt civilization of 3,000 kobolds yep. that were moving through open field and whatnot. And the party ended up sitting in a uh, farmhouse, kind of a Night of the Living Dead style, barricading the, the windows and the doors and whatnot, and shooting fireballs and shit out there. And they saw who the leader was. And they started to drop fireballs on them. Now, kobolds don't have life. No. So they don't have the hit points to withstand that shit. Even, I was not rolling deck saves because it didn't fucking matter. <laughs> so these kobolds are dying by the dozen and the leader drops. And on the next round, before they can hit with another fireball, all of the other kobolds jump in. The nearest one jams a health potion down its throat and the rest sit on top of it. So it now has cover. And then boom, another fireball and the leader goes down again. And they're systematically dragging this corpse and putting the health potions because he's doing death saves. Yeah. Right? They're dragging their, like, kind of singed leader, like, 15 feet at a time <laughs> out of the battle. It was really memorable and a little comedic, and it made them hate that guy because they couldn't get the kill in. So when they found him again later, shit got real. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So 
it, it's a lot of fun to think about how your leaders impact these combat scenarios. So, Dan, any final thoughts about mobs before we finally put this to bed? I don't know if there are. We haven't missed much. We've done six months worth of these episodes. Uh, every single thought that comes to mind. I mean, I would like to, honestly, I would like to cover solo monsters. I'd like to cover legendary level monsters. I'd like to cover uh, these these centerpiece battles because when it comes to these large scale armies, I mean, we didn't really, we, we briefly touched on how to run like sieges and shit, right? And that's always daunting as a DM, no matter your experience. And, and I mean, we suggested just don't quick time battle it have it be uh you may have suggested that i've got a very different perspective yeah. on that but you're right this is not meant to be an army versus army game we don't see that that is not the kind of war gaming that no. dungeons and dragons no. brings to the table this is a tabletop role-playing game it's a collaborative storytelling device it just happens to be really combat focused but it seems to be champion versus champion level sometimes those champions need to bust down into hordes and i feel like we've done a pretty good job uh, covering all of it, I still don't know what a Sahuigan city looks like because we no. didn't get that. We did the best with what we have from 5th edition lore, but keep in mind, 3.5 really fleshes this shit out. Yeah. There were so many, many books. books. Oh my god, they were releasing dozens of books for a very short period of time, too. Like, there are tons of things I out feel there. like there was like a monthly release. It almost feels like it. And that doesn't include the Dungeon Magazine and the Dragon Magazine that was going yeah. on at the time. So there's a ton of information out there. So the idea of the D&D wikis and whatnot, a lot of it's homebrew, but a lot of it isn't. And if you can type in 3.5 into your Google box, right, along with your Sahugan, you may get some more inspiration. But remember, what is 5th edition and what can translate appropriately? There is a very defined thread of narrative between 3.5 to 4th to 5th, right? That, that the the clock on Faerun counts with each edition. Yes. So there's a there's a thread through it. So some of the stuff that happens in 3.5 might not make sense with 5th, but the, the narrative arc through the spell plague of 4th to where we're at now, you can use that 3.5 stuff. Some of it fits. Yeah, and remember, it is called the Forgotten Realms because there are entire realms that have been forgotten in the past. And that is literally what the previous editions have been in the Forgotten Realms. Yeah. So you can find bits and pieces of lore. If there was an old um, Netherese city that used to exist, and you know that it used to sit underneath Waterdeep, but there's nothing in uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage about it, it doesn't mean it's not still there waiting to be discovered. It just got blown up at the beginning of 3rd edition, right? Yeah. So you can dig deep and find some more information. There could be cool new ways of building these uh, these monsters to flesh out your mobs as well. I mean, we talked at length to uh, to Jeff when he was covering the bugbear, but who's going to make all uh, bulwarks, mm -hmm. all right? And there there's a lot of opportunity to expand your mobs. Don't forget about the NPC stat blocks, gladiator, veteran, um, bandit. These things exist, and you know that in the dungeon master's guide, you can apply for a lot of mobs the monster stat block on top of the npc stat yeah. block and you start to mash traits and features together to make unique monsters to kind of fill out what you need don't be bound by a goblin as a goblin as a goblin and for the love of god volos mordenkainen's pick them up read the flavor text there's a ton of shit in there mm -hmm. don't be afraid to read into it and if you see that this uh flavor text mentions elves as being an enemy or a nearby ally or whatever, then read up on elves because you will get insight into how those two things are related. Yeah. So honestly, the more reading you do, the better off you will be. <laughs> but if you don't have the time for that, we will have episodes on most of these creatures as yes. we move forward. So that is finally a wrap on mob monsters for now. Aww. As there are more published materials, we may circle back to cover some new versions of monsters. But my god, as it stands now, we feel pretty good about what we've covered so far, so we're done. That's it for this episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you would like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com. And we also rely on word of mouth to get news of the podcast out there to the community. 
So please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most of the podcast apps. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the It's a Mimic podcast, and stay tuned for our return to our regular format where you never know what you're going to get. Thank you for listening to another It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, shoutouts, requests, and mailbag questions can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. Okay, Adam, we're done. We're done talking about mobs. Except for this episode. Except for, well, except for this question. Okay. This is the last question I have about mobs. I doubt it, but okay. What is the one solo creature in Dungeons and Dragons you wish was a mob? All right, let's roll. Let's roll. I got a three. I got a five. You want to know what, what solo creature should have been a mob? Um, the one that I, I always feel is just fucking forgotten about is a troglodyte. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that one. Right? Like, I know that we ranted earlier about the ones that should have gotten, um, like, a full breakdown. But of all of them, troglodytes are horribly forgotten about. Yeah. We've gotten multiple versions of them in previous editions. And it was just like, well, who gives a shit? For me, the one monster I want to see an entire base of creatures and classes and stuff based around, the Odiog. You were just wrong in the head. As a person... <laughs> I dislike you. <laughs> if you ever have the opportunity to meet Dan in person, don't. He's wrong in the head. <laughs> so, Dan, when do you use you on tea? When I need someone to swallow my children whole. Uh, I mean... Thank you for listening to an It's a Mimic production. <laughs> okay, you're done. Get it. <laughs> <laughs>